Hi Compass Kids, I am so excited to teach you another lesson today. We last time learned about the book of Judges. Today we are starting a brand new book of the Bible. And if you can read, I bet you can guess what book that is. It is the book of Ruth. So before we get started, we're gonna quickly pray. Um, but before we pray, I wanna make sure you pause the video. I want you to get your Bible and open up to the book of Ruth, which is right after Judges in the beginning of the Bible. And I want you to grab a piece of paper and a few things to write or draw with, okay? So pause the video, go get that, and let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for another morning where we can come and worship you as best we can together, Lord. I thank you for these Compass kids that are taking time out of their day to learn from your word. Um, God, we're so thankful for this book that you wrote for us, that you recorded for us so that we could learn more about your goodness and your sovereignty. So God, I pray that we would just have a great time together learning from your word, that these kids would be absorbing what we're talking about this morning, and that you would teach us uh, much from your word this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, Compass Kids, you should have your Bible open to the book of Ruth, and you should have a paper and stuff to draw with. Let me show you our board so you can get that started. You don't have to draw this part yet. That's for me. Uh, but you can draw a tree, and you can write Ruth important words. We're going to talk about some important words. We're going to draw a family tree this morning, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Okay, so... The book of Ruth opens in a really sad time. The Bible says that this book, all of the things we're gonna learn today happen during the time of Judges. You guys have been learning about the book of Judges. You've learned how Israel was in this pattern of sin and disobedience and rebellion and how God punishes them. And then Israel says, oh, this is the worst. We're so sorry. We don't want to do this anymore. God, please help us. And then God sends a judge or a deliverer to come and help them. He gets them out of um, captivity wherever they are or, or whoever is invading them. And then what do the Israelites start doing? They just start sinning again. That shows us how sinful people are and how much we need a redeemer. So this story happens during that time of Judges where there's all this cycle over hundreds of years. During this time, Israel is being punished, not with people coming and being in charge, but this time they're being punished with a famine. We're going to write that word, famine. A famine means there's no food. In fact, we're learning today a little bit about the city of Bethlehem, which you guys know is where Jesus is going to be born much, much later. But the city of Bethlehem, that word Bethlehem actually means house of bread. In other words, there's so much food in Bethlehem. So it's kind of ironic. It's kind of funny that there's a famine. There's no food in Bethlehem, the house of bread. So we're going to draw bread. I'm going to draw lots of little doodles with you guys this morning. Doodles and words. It's going to be a lot of fun. Famine. There's no bread in Israel. There's no food in Israel. They are suffering a severe, severe famine. And during this time, we are learning about an Israelite family. Okay, you guys ready? You've got your writing utensil. Let's write about this family. Um, there was a man in the family. His name was Elimelech. Let me make sure I spell his name right. Elimelech. And he marries a woman named Naomi. And they have two sons together. So they are married and they have two sons. That's if you've never seen a family tree before, this is how we show who's married, what children they have, and then what children those people have, and it just goes down and down and down. So these two have two sons. Let me make sure I get their names right for you. Yes, these are kind of funny names, you guys. The first son is named, oh, I'm gonna say it wrong, Chilean. Chilean, I'm not sure how to say it. I'll write these names, by the way, on your screen so you can spell them correctly. Or you can look in your Bible in chapter one of Ruth. Uh, and then they have another son. His name is Malone. And they are a happy family living in Israel, except then the famine comes and they're not so happy. 
in fact, they s travel away from Israel and they go to uh, a country called Moab. Moab does not have people there who trust the one true God. In Moab, there are people who worship idols. Do you guys remember a rule God gave the Israelites? Did God tell the Israelites that they were not allowed to marry people from other countries? Yeah, God did not want them worshiping other people's gods because those were fake gods and he didn't want their hearts to be led astray. But because there was a famine, Elimelech, Naomi, Chilion, and Malon leave Israel. They go to Moab and they marry two Moabite women. Okay, so their names, Chilion marries a woman named um, Orpah. These two get married. And Malone marries Ruth. Have you guys, does that name sound familiar? It's the name of the whole book of this part of the Bible. He marries a woman named Ruth. Is Ruth an Israelite woman who worships God? No, she is actually a woman from Moab who at this point of the story does not worship God. And they get married um, and then suddenly, something very sad happens. Elimelech dies, Chilion dies, and Malon dies. And now it's just three women, Naomi and her daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth, her not, not really her real daughters, but daughters through marriage. So it's just the three of them now, um, back at this time, women were not allowed to go do hard work to earn money. So Naomi is sitting there and she's thinking, oh man, these two cannot provide for themselves. They need new husbands. They can't stay with me. If they stay with me, they're not going to have any money or any food to eat. So uh, one day God decided to end the famine in Israel. Israel had food again. So Naomi is going to go back to Israel. And so she turns to Orpah and Ruth and she says, oh, you guys should stay here in your home in Moab. And you should, you're very young. You should just get married again. Marry Moabite men. Be happy. Have enough food. Have a new family. Um, you guys need to for forget me and my family. I'm going to move back to Israel. So Orpah decides to do that. Orpah leaves. Bye, Orpah. She goes, uh, she stays in Moab and she gets married to someone else. But Ruth does something very interesting. Ruth uh, listens to Naomi. We're going to really quick uh, look at uh, Ruth chapter 1, verse 13. Can you guys go there with me? Ruth chapter 1, verse 13. We are going to go a little bit past those first few sentences. And in verse 13, I want you to look for a capital N and it starts with no. This is Naomi talking and she's talking to Orpah and Ruth and she says, no, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She is so sad. Naomi says, God has not been good to me. You guys should go and live your happy life. God has not been good to me. Um, you need to just leave me alone. And so Ruth, or we said Orpah leaves, but Ruth does something interesting. Will you guys skip on down to verse 16, Ruth 1, 16? But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge or where you live, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Let's keep reading. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. Wow. Ruth does not leave. Ruth says, no, Naomi, you are my family. Wherever you go, I'm going to go with you. And wherever you want to live, I'm going to live with you. And not only that, you guys, Ruth says, whoever your God is, 
I want that God to be my God. And so Ruth becomes a follower of the one true God. She was not an Israelite. She was not even related to Abraham at all. She was from Moab, which was a pagan country, and she becomes a follower of God. That is awesome. That's kind of like how when we become a Christian, God accepts us into his family, even though we were sinners and we should not be in his family at all. God accepts us because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. So that's pretty cool. We get to see that happen even in the Old Testament. Um, and Ruth makes this declaration of love towards Naomi. She says, I'm not going to worry about myself or what's going to happen to me because I'm not married and I don't have any money and I can't get a job. I'm going to live with you and I'm going to be um, your servant and I'm going to help you. Uh, I'm going to be your family. Okay, that's awesome, you guys. We've learned really quickly that Ruth is an awesome lady. That's why we have this whole book about her, right? Okay, so Ruth decides to follow Israel's God. She decides to live and be with Naomi. Um, but Naomi is still having some problems. The Bible says that Naomi is still very bitter and very angry at God for killing her husband and her two sons. And she starts actually calling herself a different name. She starts calling her name Mara. Mara means bitter. I, can you guys think of a good picture for bitter? I'm gonna draw a face maybe like if you were to eat something that was really gross or sour mara means bitter naomi starts is so upset at what god has done she calls herself bitter she says yep god has been bitter towards me i'm bitter against god and god is just not not doing things the way that he should is that a good attitude i mean of course she's upset but to be bitter against God is not the right answer. Um, she is not remembering that God is sovereign. Have you guys heard us talk about that word before? It's a very long word, but it's easy to say. Let's write it down. Sovereign, I'm gonna write this word really big because we are gonna talk about it a lot. My older guys, you can see this word reign in here, like how a king reigns. It's similar in meaning. Sovereign means that God is in control of everything, everywhere, all the time. God knows exactly how far, uh, uh, sorry, God knows exactly how each blade of grass outside is gonna move in the wind. He knows exactly where each bird and butterfly live and where they're gonna get their food. He knows exactly what's gonna happen in the future and he knows how it's gonna all work together for good. And he is in charge of all of it. Nothing ever happens that God doesn't know about that God is not in charge of. God allows all things to happen. Nothing happens without God knowing about it or God saying that it's allowed to happen. So Naomi should know this and she should remember, you know what? I know these terrible things happen to me, but God is sovereign and I can trust in him. I can trust that everything is gonna work together for good. And we're gonna see today, a lot of awesome things happen and we can see that God is sovereign, but Naomi's not seeing that right now. She's just seeing her problems and she's really focusing on that. I think this is a good lesson for us to learn right now, you guys, because some of us are hurting and some of us have a lot of tough things going on at home right now, but we also can trust that God is sovereign. This God is the same God that we have in Ruth. He's the same one today. So we're gonna learn about this. I'm excited to learn more with you about how God is sovereign, and I'm really excited to show you what he does with Ruth, okay? So let's continue in God's word. We have Naomi and Ruth. They are two widows. That means they don't have any husbands. And because they're widows, they don't have any money coming in. Their, their husbands are the ones that usually bring in money so they can buy food or shelter or clothing, but they don't have husbands who can do that. So God actually made a really great rule for widows. He made a rule that anyone who has fields in their home, um, anyone who owns land and has fields, they had to leave the outer parts of the field 
full of grain or fruit or whatever they had. The people who were harvesting and gathering all of the finished crops could not take stuff from the very edge of the field. They were to leave that for any widows or orphans or people who cannot ha- afford any food. God provided so that those people could go eat that for food. So Ruth does that one day. She leaves and she happens across the field of a man named Boaz. Okay, I'm going to write his name up on our chart because he's going to be really important soon. She's going to look for food. She happens upon a field uh, that is owned by Boaz. And oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you guys this. This is pretty cool. Boaz was the son of a man named Salmon and a man and a woman named Rahab. Do you guys remember learning about Rahab? She was the woman who lived in Jericho, who saved those Israelite spies. Well, she had a son named Boaz, and it's his field that we're talking about. So Ruth is traveling. She doesn't know where she's going, but she comes across Boaz's field, the same Boaz that's the son of Rahab. Pretty cool, right? You think that's a coincidence? There's just an accident? Of course not. God is sovereign. God is in charge of everything. He plans everything. He's doing something really special here for Ruth. So uh, Boaz was a godly man, we know. The Bible tells us he was very, very kind to his workers that were helping him. He provided his workers with food and water and a place to live. And so the servants one day tell Boaz, they say, hey, there's this woman, Ruth, and she's gathering grain because she's a widow and she leaves with, or she lives with another widow. And they have no food and no place to live and nothing to eat. And Boaz hears about this and he decides, I need to do, I need to do something about this. He's a very godly man. He offers for Naomi and Ruth to come and eat the food and drink that he already provides for his workers instead of just getting the leftovers from the field, which that's, that's all he had to do. But he decides, no, you guys are going to come eat with us and have our food and anything you need, you can come and have this. And not only that, he said, okay, workers, I don't want you to just leave the outside edges of the field for them, for them to collect from. I want you to leave lots of food for them to get for free. The Bible says that Ruth was carrying 30 to 50 pounds of barley home with her at the end of the day. 30 or 50 pounds? That's how much some of you weigh. Can you imagine a big sack weighing that much with just grain to make all the food that they need? That's awesome. Boaz is a very godly man. So Ruth goes home to Naomi and Ruth says, Naomi, you'll never believe what happened today. I was going to this field and I met um, this man named Boaz. He was so kind. He's offered us Um, food to eat and drink and we're saved this is going to be great and Naomi says wait Boaz I know Boaz Boaz is a relative of Elimelech he is actually related to me how awesome is that you guys do you guys think that was an accident that Boaz just so happens to be related to Naomi's husband of course not because God is sovereign God planned all of this ahead of time. And so when Boaz hears that Ruth is related to Naomi, who used to be married to Elimelech, his relative, Boaz is so excited and he offers even more wonderful things for Ruth to take home to Naomi so that they could live a life that is where they're never hungry or cold or anything like that. How good is that? We could end the story right there and say, wow, God is so good. God is so sovereign. And wow, that's the end of the story. But it's not. We still have several chapters of Ruth to go through. So you guys, the next thing that happens, can anyone maybe guess? I want you to maybe pause and try to guess what happens with Ruth and Boaz if you don't already know. Um, Naomi talks to Ruth and she says, okay, this is too much of a coincidence. Um, I think God is doing something here. What I want you to do, Ruth, is I want you to go to Boaz and I want you to ask Boaz to spread the wing of his cloak over you. In other words, 
I want you to go to Boaz and ask him to be your protector, your helper, your leader. What does that sound like? What is Ruth asking Boaz to be? Her husband. Naomi says, Ruth, I want you to go ask Boaz to be your husband. Now, this is kind of strange. She's a young Moabite woman and Boaz is an older Israelite man and Ruth is supposed to ask him to marry her. It's not even the other way around. That is so strange. Why would that work out? Well, it works out because God is sovereign and Ruth and Boaz get married. Boaz is actually so taken aback by this. He's so honored that Ruth would even ask this, that he does a lot of different things to try and make sure she marries maybe someone else who's younger or richer, or maybe um, one of one of Elimelech and Naomi's family members that still need a wife. He goes and checks all of that and makes sure that there's no one else that Ruth should marry instead. And God provides and, God's, and God makes it very clear, nope, Boaz, you are the one that is supposed to marry Ruth. And so they get married. Boaz says yes, and he becomes something called, we're gonna write down this important word, a family, this is two words that we have put together with a hyphen, a family redeemer. A family redeemer. That means he is someone who rescues, provides for, and protects relatives who are in need. So Boaz decides, I'm gonna protect Ruth and Naomi, I'm going to provide for them, and I'm gonna rescue them. How awesome. Is he getting anything out of this? Not really, I mean, he's getting a wife, which is great, but he's doing all of this because he is a godly man who loves God and wants to serve God. So, wow, so many good things have happened, right? First, Naomi is bitter, and now after all of these things happen, Naomi and Ruth start seeing how good and sovereign God is. And they, it's just awesome. It's just something that we get to celebrate as we read this whole book. All we can say at the end of the book of Ruth is, wow, God is good and God is sovereign. It doesn't end there. We have a little bit of an ending from our story. Um, let's see, let's go. Will you guys turn with me to the New Testament, Matthew chapter one? Matthew chapter one is when um, the guy who was writing the book of Matthew, his name was Matthew, he wanted to write down all of Jesus's family. So he actually starts all the way at the beginning of the Bible with Abraham. He starts with Abraham. Let's look uh, Matthew chapter one, verses two. We're going to read all the way through six. And you guys are going to hear a lot of names that you remember. Okay, so Matthew's going to have his own little family tree and he's going to tell you all about Jesus's family. Okay, starting with Abraham, because remember, God made Abraham that first promise. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. <gasps> what happens? They have a baby named Obed. God blesses them with a baby. Let's keep reading. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of who? David. You guys are learning all about David and Awana. But before David, God was still doing some pretty wonderful things. So Ruth and Boaz get married and they have a child. He, Obed gets married later on and has another child. Jesse gets married later and has David. And does anyone remember eventually what happens? Who comes from David after a long, long time? And you guys could even keep reading if you wanted to and you could see exactly how many more people there were in this line. But eventually, who do we get? Jesus, eventually Jesus is born. You guys, because Boaz was so faithful and because Ruth was such a, a faithful and obedient father, follower of 
the Lord, God decides to bless them. They were obedient, they loved God, and even though Ruth was a Moabite, God names her in Jesus' family genealogy, in his family tree. She even gets mentioned. Okay, is that pretty cool? I think that that is pretty cool. And you guys, before we end our lesson, we're going to remind you one more time. What is this word? Sovereign. God is sovereign over everything going on right now. Everything that was happening back here, up here in our story, it looked really, really bad and really hopeless. But wow, look what God did later on. I wish Naomi would have said, you know what, Ruth, this is really terrible, but God is going to work it out. I wish she would have been like that, but she wasn't. But God still chose to show them what he could do. So right now, whatever it is you guys are dealing with, I want you to maybe think about it for a minute. I want you to try and remember that God is still sovereign. This is the same God you and I pray to. God never changes. See all these cool coincidences he made happen to work out for good? It's the same God. He's still doing that kind of thing today. So I want you guys to think about that with me today. I want you to maybe talk about it with your parents if you still have questions about that. Um, but we're going to pray right now and end our lesson. We're going to thank God for being sovereign. Will you pray with me? Okay, let's pray. God, I thank you for these Compass, Compass kids that have come to learn about you and about Ruth and Naomi and Boaz and how wonderful you were that even though Naomi was disobedient and she was bitter and angry at you, you still worked through her. You still showed her and showed everybody and showed us how sovereign and good you are. God, I pray for these kids that whatever it is that they're going through, that they can stop and they can ask you for more trust and they can ask you to help them have a good attitude and not be bitter like Naomi was, but to maybe see the bigger picture and be able to see, no, God is going to do something good in the future, whether or not they get to see it happen, that they would trust that you are good and that you are in control of absolutely everything and nothing happens without your permission. So God, thank you for that. Thank you for being a God who shows us this in your word. And God, I pray that we have a great rest of our Sunday worshiping you and worshiping Jesus, who is going to come back one day and be that perfect sovereign king for us. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys, you have a good rest of your Sunday. We will see you for our last Awana lesson on Thursday. And next week, we will continue with a new book of the Bible. If you want a little hint, you can skip forward in the book of Ruth and see what we're learning next. Okay, bye.